Welcome to Season 2, Episode 23 of Comic Book Nation, the official podcast of comicbook.com. I am your host, Kofi Outlaw, and with me today are my co-hosts, Janelle Wheeler. Everybody. Matthew Aguilar. What up? And back with us again, Mr. Turn Up Charlie himself, Charlie Ridgely is back. What's up, guys? And uh, yeah, we're still on another quarantine home edition of the show. You know how it goes in this new world order. So today we are going to be talking about Netflix scooping up what could be a new uh, shot of life in the zombie horror genre. We're going to talk about a possible big casting coming to Marvel. We got our first look at the reboot of Dune and a bunch of famous people looking crazy in their Dune outfits. We know some things about Rick and Morty's final stretch of episodes we want to talk about real quick. Plus, if we have time to it, uh, if to do it, I don't know, actually. We got more of a show that filled out here, but we're going to talk about something that happened in the uh, Marvel Netflix universe that's kind of sad. And we get to talk about what happened when SNL tried an at-home edition. Uh, we're going to complain a little bit about Westworld. And we got to get to Tiger King because Tiger King is not done yet. It's not over. So we have to talk about the latest from Tiger King. And Matt has some stuff he, I think, wants to talk to you about, too. So uh, we like to try to let him out of the pen every now and again. So <laughs> so Matt has some Matt stuff he wants to get. Oh, I miss wow. Matt's laugh. What a sell. Yeah, <laughs> Matt stuff. So let's get to the top of the show because we actually have a lot to do. Um, yeah, as I said, Netflix. So Netflix is still getting that content ready. And uh, there's a big question about what you know subject matter and tv is going to be especially now that there's so much such as big social upheaval that we've had with the kind of coronavirus pandemic and kind of how is storytelling going to be affected by all this so netflix is trying to come out the gate fast they are scooping up a zombie horror kind of show that they're developing based on a korean webtoon series that's gotten very popular called now at our school and what it does is it basically kind of mixes a quarantine infection story with a zombie horror story it's about a kid bunch of kids at school who get locked down in their school when it's revealed that the zombie like, virus is ripping already kind of in their town and infecting people and they are locked down in this school so netflix is basically tapping k horror you know some korean horror they're gonna get they have a kind of completely kind of korean creative team on this and they're trying to maybe find that next Walking Dead. Uh, anybody so here, so you underground that they read Korean webtoons like uh, now at our school? I, I mean, like I'm something that would be like I'm. I was. I was into. It. <laughs> why? Why no? <laughs> like why comic, is that me? Because you're a comic hipster. <laughs> you're like, you're I, okay. Well, oh, no. I've never been called a comic hipster. I don't think. I don't think that's a thing. Well, it's, it's scary accurate. I mean, people have just overlooked it for too long. Like, <laughs> look at, I, mean, I have not. It looks like wrestling, but if I can tell you, if you see the rest of this man's setup at home, like right now, I can tell you <laughs> why you might get that impression just a little bit. So, uh, you know, I guess we'll throw it over to Charlie. What do you think about this? You are our streaming guru, Charlie, and you were once our one of our Walking Dead gurus uh, a long time ago. So, what what do you think about this? Uh, I mean the the zombie genre at this point is I f it's really hard to make something quality that people are going to care about because of the walking dead and because of how many properties have tried to emulate the walking dead um and you know they often don't work but you know i don't read korean web cartoons but one of the best zombie movies of the last decade or more uh came from south korea in uh train to busan which is streaming on netflix right now um it's fast paced. It's crazy. It's scary. It's, it's really, really intense. Um, there's a sequel coming this year. Uh, the it, train to Busan is, is incredible if, if you haven't seen it, but seeing that and seeing how the Korean film industry has handled the zombie genre recently, it gives me a lot of hope for what this show can be, especially if Netflix is willing to throw money at it. Uh, like they think they, they have some of their other, you know, uh, international original shows like money heist, uh, money Heist has a huge budget behind it, and I think that if if Netflix gives it that same kind of money, this this could really really be something that genre fans have have hoped for since The Walking Dead. You know, for a while, even though it's good now, it got really stale. I think people were kind of hoping for another zombie type show to 
to give them that spark that The Walking Dead did at the beginning. Um, and this might finally be that thing people have been waiting for. Janelle? That, yeah, I think that um, The Walking Dead did try to do a spinoff, like a coming of age, young community spinoff. It's called um, The World, wait, The, the, the Walking World Dead Beyond. World Beyond. Yeah. Um, and honestly, all I've seen is previews from that. And I just kind of like rolled my eyes because I don't really care about their story. Like I, I like the walking dead for what it is. Fear is, is cool. It's its own thing, but I don't want to see this coming of age zombie uh, thing in my world of the walking dead. So I actually look forward to this one because it is kind of the same coming of age, uh, quarantine, uh, angle but i'm actually interested in this for whatever reason i'm i'm super interested in w what they're going to do here for sure i mean yeah I, I think it's the same thing for me i think this will be different because i think this will be one of the first things to actually play up on the quarantine isolation experience and kind of add that to it and it it be quickly becomes a metaphor for something like the coronavirus pandemic and you know social distancing which is what the best horror is made out of and so i have faith netflix knows what it's doing that's why it's still king i wonder uh, what other kind of shows are going to come out um now we're scooping out a lot of horror developing. korean yeah. series but uh no there are people it, the discussions are already happening in hollywood we have some on comicbook.com you can start to see you know people are already discussing like how do you incorporate the fact that this happened into like star trek and in, in the yeah. history of earth that this was a real part of our history and how are other people and people are there's already the office makers or producers are already making a office coronavirus. Space, wait, wait, are you talking about Space Force? No, 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 no. The makers of the office are, have already started developing a workplace comedy based on like oh, the new reality Lord. of the coronavirus and like no way. Zoom. Yeah, guys, don't read comicbook.com. Wow. It, it's yeah. basically a whole oh. show of that like yeah. that Zoom sketch on SNL, but yeah. You know, exactly as a whole That's series great. kind of like running a business in, in the post kind of in the coronavirus reality kind of you know in that whole thing and how to maintain workplace relationships and in that kind of thing so yeah so they're already hard at work hollywood's not wasting any time they're on it like they're, i told you they're not sleeping during these times we all think oh there's nothing to talk about and they now hollywood's on it so they're gonna make money off this coronavirus once we all hopefully survive so Make, speaking of making money and moves while we're all kind of on lockdown, there's been the rumor that something we've all wanted to happen could possibly be happen, that uh, John Krasinski possibly meeting with Marvel Studios, right? You know, I guess that Zoom, over Zoom, they're having a little Zoom meeting. Could you, could you imagine doing a screen test over Zoom for Marvel? <laughs> You'd be imagine like, yeah. Zoom getting hacked It'd in be the like, middle my of My life that is great, casting? FML, yeah. uh, And if there was anything to hack Zoom for, it's, that'd be that'd be it. But uh, the <laughs> rumor that he's meeting with Marvel, and of course, fans, you know, are freaking out because they've wanted John. I mean, they've basically decided that John Krasinski is going to be Reed Richards in the MCU, even though we don't have any kind of confirmation that's ever going to be a thing. Like that's <laughs> what they want. So this is like what it's what it what it is. So now people are kind of freaking out. So. Geeks Worldwide kind of reported it that uh, who that the yeah he met with Marvel Studios virtually because um, Marvel Studios the train ain't stopping like I said so they're still at it um, and we don't know what it would be but I mean he's expressed that he would love to do it he'd love to join the MCU he basically said I like money um, and so yeah is there anybody else in, I know Jim Viscardi he isn't here but he wanted to throw grenades from the sideline <laughs> like we're in the freaking modern warfare battle zone gulag and he's got a fistful of rocks and like so he doesn't he doesn't and, like this casting idea he or? according to Jim now Jim says things in ways that that sound like their general opinion but they're really just Jim opinion <laughs> um, and so he said that like he basically would love he doesn't think that's the best thing for John Krasinski to play. Uh, and I was just like, really? They, they literally started drawing books to look like this guy. Well, I guess that's my, my biggest thing is, and we'll get to Jim's uh, <laughs> a little mini grenade. Yeah. In a minute. Uh, like my biggest thing is like, aside from since Samuel L. Jackson, has there been a character 
you know, like a comic character that people have been like, no, he is like, it's a foregone conclusion that this will happen. That if there's ever a movie made, this will happen because like, that's what happened with Nick Fury, but that's because an artist started drawing them as them and then got sued in the comics, like way before movies. Right. So in this case, like, is that, has there really been another character like that? Like John Krasinski, I agree with you, has been just like, it's de facto, he is. Like everyone assumes there's so much fan art of Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic, it's ridiculous. There's also fan art of Emily Blunt as Sue, but like that hasn't taken over as much, I think because she's turned down two that. different roles I in the MCU. That. So people are like, she'll be choosy because she's Emily yeah. Blunt. Uh, true, <laughs> but like, true. I, I haven't seen that level of, like now I feel bad for whoever it ends up being. Cause like, I don't know if Krasinski will do it, but whoever if it ends up being somebody else i actually feel bad for them because that sucks because like this thing has yeah, been set so drawing high. my face like john krasinski on posters uh, and then they go, I, I, I don't hey, think, it, I don't think there's been i don't think there's been a situation like that like you're talking about but the, the only thing i can kind of relate it to the only i mean fans are so divided about everything the only thing that has been so universally like we all want this one thing it was J. Jonah jameson in the mcu that was the one thing, like, if, if you bring back, you know, J. Jonah Jameson, it has to be J.K. Simmons. Like, that's the only thing we accept. Like, everyone universally kind of agreed on that. Yeah. And when it happened, there was no complaints of, like, Marvel just listening to fans. Everyone's like, that was a good idea. And we all knew it. We're glad you did it. And I think <laughs> yeah. that I can see the same thing with Krasinski, where it's like, there's a lot of fan stuff all over the place that's never going to come to fruition, that they're never going to listen to. The Krasinski thing, I think, is one of those, I don't necessarily think they listen to fans, but fans are talking about it and they're not going to, they're not going to shy away from it because of fan conversation. It's like, no, this is a, he's a great fit for the character. I think. Um, I mean, let's remember he already has a relationship with Marvel. He was, yeah. he, he had a contract say, ready to sign for dude, Captain America. I was on that beat. I, I knew him and the dude who played bullseye in daredevil uh, is one of his best friends is somebody I grew up with. And I had like, my phone was just on a desk and I was just sitting there with like two articles, like, <laughs> here we go. Like, here we go. Like, which one am I pushing? Awesome. Krasinski or, or oh uh, Wilson Bethel, like, or Bethel, whatever his name is. And like, I had the images, like we had it ready because it was so close. This Captain America thing went on for so long and we were like covering this and had all these people. We had like, people under desks at Marvel, like, who are you picking? And like, they didn't even know. I might be and wrong, was, but wasn't like, it? Chris they, Evans. And then, like, didn't they pick Chris Keith Evans at first? And then he he said no. It, it was a and then they went on a search. Yes. See, it went. It, I at this point I don't remember the detail because it was Evans, then it wasn't. Krasinski had it for like a minute, yeah. and, it, and it was, and it was like I a short thing. Yeah. And like we were almost hit that, and I think we had to pull that article. Like Mama. it got, it was crazy. Oh jeez, yeah. man. And then they that, found like Evan, Chris Evans, and like yeah, man, that was nuts. Because, and like okay, so I don't agree with Jim's thing of like, is there a better character like? Maybe, maybe I got, there's so many characters like- Cardiac. In yes, I mean, Cardiac, yes. I, okay, as someone who cannot stand Mr. Fantastic, like he's a complete jerk off, I hate him. <laughs> I hate that wow. Character. I hate that character so much. So because of that, Krasinski's too likable. I like John Krasinski and stuff. I and he's gonna make you like Mr. Fantastic. He might, he might, but like Mr. Fantastic has been continuously shown to be a jerk, kind of a bad dad, <laughs> kind of a crap husband. Well, see, that, that's what I like so much about the about the the current Fantastic Four book, um, is that he has to deal with those things. Like, but he's always he, dealing with them because right, he's but I mean, like, terrible. It, they're, they're told to his face. Like, so, like his, Sue is like, dude, they're, like, chill out. But I think um, that's the thing Krasinski can do is like Krasinski can be like an aloof genius, but like still likable and like enough of a puppy that you'd be like, yeah, I can see why Sue. Here's, Sue here's my other like thing. I think guy. that Krasinski can fill a role in the MCU that Evans has filled for this long. And he can be that kind of like, um, that, that moral compass to the heroes in the franchise, you know, where you had Captain America and, and all his values. And then you had Tony kind of being the wild card. I think that while Mr. Fantastic is different than Captain America doesn't share those exact same values the kind of the kind of read that I see Krasinski playing would be one that can kind of someone that holds the team together and kind of says, Hey, like we, we have to do the right thing here and, and keep pushing people towards the right direction. I yeah, agree it's a quiet you. place thing. Like he'll, he'll maybe be a bad dad in the beginning, but at the, at the end he'll be like heroic dad. 
I agree no, with you that it, that is the version he would probably play. That's not really the character in the books. Well, and like Tony Stark, like, look, Tony Stark was also a jerk, a giant jerk in the in the comics. And Robert Downey Jr. made him likable enough, even though really like Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man is also kind of a jerk, like compared to Evan's cap. Like he's there's a dynamic. I for and- yeah. I, for me, need that. Like, I don't necessarily want Mr. Fantastic being a moral compass. Like, that's not really what he does. He's the aloof, I think, in science. I think in ideas. It doesn't exist if it's not based in fact. And he has a like, soft God complex. Like, well, but like, the, yeah, like, a, we, we can have this whole cap. conversation. We can have this whole conversation about Spider-Man, and that's not the Spider-Man we, we're getting in the MCU. So, yeah, true. But I just know. think like I want somebody else to be the moral compass to Mr. Fantastic's tony stark like i you need another yeah i mean i want sue to be like the person who grounds and like is the moral yeah. compass of the family um i also think it has to be a little different because i, I would want to see them do something like the maker and i would like to see oh, john yes. krasinski be able to do like both <laughs> half so you would have to make the the normal root uh read a little softer so because That's he would true. have this kind of dark twin version of himself and i would love to see krasinski play that like yeah. he's a great up. actor like, I oh i just cursed oh my god like a messed up version of jim like just an <laughs> evil jim like, Frank <laughs> type. like the one who's like babysitting venom's kid and it's just like yes everything's fine and like you know venom's kid's yeah. possibly dead you know <laughs> like that kind Baker's of awesome i you know, i do love so. that idea so yes if that's the case i agree do a softer Mr. Fantastic, if I also get Maker, which is cool. Yeah. Yes, I like so, that. I mean, that's all. We can't spend too much time on this because we got to find out if this thing is even happening. So, we're going to move on right along to something that is definitely happening, which is our first look at Dune. So, I know all of you are such big Dune fans, so I thought <laughs> I'd pull this up uh, to get your Dune fix. Uh, but Dune's coming back, and it's coming from uh, Dennis Vluet when Vluet away. I can never say his. Denis Villeneuve. Villain, yeah, say that again, Charlie. I think it's, I, th- I think the first name is Denis, and it's Villeneuve. No, yeah, it's Denis. I know Denis, but like I can never say his name. It's just crazy. Anyway, dude who blew Blue Aid Runner, you know, Arrival, all those hot. I mean, he's done pretty awesome films. So he's the guy who they finally tapped to do a remake of uh, of I almost said Blade <laughs> of Dune, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we got our first look, and it's a star-studded cast. So, you know, Dune set on a fictional sci-fi world, so everybody's got, it's a very, I mean, and it is like one of the deepest kind of sci-fi world-building mythologies, and I was never a big, huge Dune fan myself. I never got into like the, uh, which I call it, the um, 80s one, but uh, yeah, we're here. We're all going to have to drop a little this. early for me to really be into it. My parents weren't into it. So therefore I wasn't, I, I don't know a lot about it. My parents were, and they watched like every holiday, but it could never make sense. It was people with blue eyes. And I was like, what is happening in this thing? Like it was David Lynch. So weird as hell. It was just like, yeah, not for me, but <clears throat> excuse me. It's not Corona. Um, we did get our first look and basically, I mean, this new Dune remake has everybody in it. It has Zendaya, Jason Momoa, Rebecca Ferguson, Josh Brolin, Timothy Chalamet, who everybody loves, uh, and as kind of like the main character. And so we're just kind of getting a sense of the world that they're building and stuff. And the pictures that are in here, they look pretty, uh, pretty intense. I uh, can I just say that Oscar Isaac looked very worn down by the end of the Star Wars run. I am not going to lie; I'm shocked to see him in another sci-fi epic well, he's with somebody who knows what they're doing several films i mean and it, in the picture he's also looking at they're like what what do you got to say you got something to say about my costume I mean, you, you could say that though about jj abrams i mean he like ryan johnson like these were great these were really good directors and had track records so i mean i imagine he didn't go into there going like oh well oh, yeah, yeah. I, nice. I, I was speaking directly to the last skywalker the rise of skywalker whatever oh well i'm just saying like but period though like he looked kind of over the Star Wars yeah. thing. Yeah, like but he, I think that even though this is a big budget sci-fi thing, the process of like of Denis and wh- what he brings to a film, like I think it's just so different from a usual kind of blockbuster, even though it's the same the same type of genre and budget. I mean, it looks cool. I, I bl- Dune was always a blind spot for me as well. Like I just, ne- I kind of missed it. It wasn't even that it wasn't during my time frame. It's just, I kind of missed it. I never got sucked into that series and you know i i will say though like charlie said this is 
it has a very devout like following and it's Dune is very popular as in like the IP, but it's not translated to, you know, like big screen or small screen like giant success and it's not as mainstream. I mean, this could end up being, you know, uh, another Witcher type thing where it has a very devout following of fans, but then once it's put on this and it attracts people, it gets that, it's that mainstream hit. Like maybe that's the case. I hope so. Just for all the Dune fans. I know Jamie's somewhere rooting for it. So, you know, but I mean, it looks cool, but that's it, it, really- it was It was a blind spot to me for a while. And actually Jamie got me like, kind of convinced me to, to start reading it. I got, um, I downloaded the audio book to listen to on the way to work. And I made it like a week before we stopped driving before, to the office. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I'm probably a quarter of the way into it, maybe a third. Um, and I can see why it became such a big deal, you know, at least the books. It very much kind of has elements of Star Wars. You can see how this had some influence over Star Wars. And it has a lot of what makes Game of Thrones really enjoyable, at least in his first couple books slash seasons. You know, it has a lot of like the political imbalance and the world building and the feuding families and factions and stuff uh, that you find in Game of Thrones. And so when you think about the potential of something being Star Wars and Game of Thrones, like it's it's really, really exciting, especially when you have a cast that is that stacked. And I mean, like Rebecca Ferguson plays Lady Jessica, um, Paul's mother. And that's one of the best casting decisions, period, in a very long time. Like when you, when you are in that book and you see how Jessica operates and how she thinks and how she acts, Rebecca Ferguson is just so, so perfect for that character. And like, I mean, of all the people, she's the one I'm most excited to see kind of come to life in this because she looks the part, she acts the part. Like it's a knockout casting. Yep. Well, there you go. So, Dune. It's basically Game of Thrones, politics, and society, but in sci-fi. And now you have your first look, but this cast looks pretty good. And Denis is like one of the best directors out there. So take a look at that on comicbook.com movies and check it out. Uh, something more lively and fun we could talk about is uh, Rick and Morty. So we've been waiting. Rick and Morty, now we're going to come and save us with these last season 10B episodes. Oh, oh that's my child waking up because the monitor is not off. So that's great. <laughs> We're running a great show here today. Stream <laughs> should start any minute now. But uh, I have construction like right outside my door, so I keep muting my mic. <laughs> it's just yeah. Uh... Fortunately, you can't mute the children. They they continue to make noise. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, so we got some uh, titles. <laughs> we know we're getting it back. We're gonna get some titles now. So we got some good ones in you know, these titles are actually kind of fun. They were fun for the first half and kind of predicting what the episodes would be. And uh, I'm liking some of these second ones. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? There's Primordius, Never Ricking Morty. <laughs> I like that. Childrick of Mort. <laughs> the Vat of Acid <laughs> episode. <laughs> The Vat of Acid episode, I, I feel like is going to be something really messed up. And of great. course, Star, Star Mort, Rick Turn of the Jerry, which is <laughs> one of my favorite things. Um, yeah. This is my that's, first time hearing these. I'm pumped. Oh, that's like, awesome. Yeah. So these are going to, I mean, the Star Mort, like, alone is like, I mean, I got to see that. If that's any kind of like great Star Wars riff, it, I wonder what's going to be. So. Yeah, I actually did a rewatch of Rick and Morty season four. I was pretty hard on it in the beginning, but I did a rewatch and I've actually liked it more since I've been. I told you, it's good. It, 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 calm down. It's all right. Don't turn up too far. But it's not know. the best season, but it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's better when you're separated from it and and you're not like hanging all your expectations on it. Like, yeah, it is better. But I, I do hope they get. I mean, there are some things I hope we get from this. I do want to see more of the evil Morty thing. I'm like so heavily invested in that storyline. So I hope we get some evil Morty reveals and pick up after that. Uh, Tales from the Citadel. Um, yeah. Oh, God. It's it's very much. So I'm watching There's one with the acid again. bat. It's freaking me out. Like it's well that that's gonna be a. It's either gonna be a joke about the Joker. It's gonna have a bad ass, and that's gonna be it. Or it's gonna be completely dedicated to like a storyline, like the Joker. Um, or it's going to be like a vat of acid like the drug what if this is the creation crazy. of evil morty oh what if they be... give evil morty like a joker origin story and this oh is how evil morty God. is created <laughs> he, gets, but he gets acid in his eye that and gets the great. eye patch 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> Brilliant. That'd be crazy. I, I, mean, I, I mean, it's could, totally a Rick it. and Morty thing. It'd be like a whole episode of thing and then like the very end some acid splashes in his eye or something. That'd be like, that'd be a totally Rick and Morty thing like that. So we'll see. But uh, yeah, looking forward to that. I can't, I mean, I, at this point, I really need Rick and Morty back for uh, it just to kind of keep our sanity going. So looking forward to that, getting the last half of that season. Uh, so those are the episodes. You can look them up on comicbook.com TV. Uh, what are we at? What are we at? What does Richard say we are at for uh, time? 25 minutes in? Oof, that's late. Oh, man. So I don't know if we can't get into this whole Marvel Netflix thing. It's kind of sad. <laughs> it's a long debate. But uh, we'll let you think. Poor uh, Deborah Ann Wall is having a hard time after her starring role as Karen Page on Daredevil. And uh, she's a little down. And so we were going to ask if, if Marvel Netflix has possibly broken some of these people with their weird career trajectories. But uh, quick around the room. Do you think that uh, the ending, they kind of killed the Marvel Netflix franchise too fast, hurt these people's careers? Matt? I mean, did, did they kill it too fast yes obviously like i feel like that's obvious because it wasn't supposed to be the end they were they were some shows were doing quite well um as far as hurt their careers i mean yes from a from a from a personal standpoint absolutely i mean if you have a hit role in a show for three seasons and you're riding a high and then someone just goes nope and it has nothing to do with you it has absolutely nothing to do with like your performance or anything else. It's strictly business, which is what that was. I mean, like yes and no, because I know that's like part of the industry. That's, that's something that's not just inherent to Marvel TV shows. Like that stuff happens all the time, especially in Hollywood. So, I mean, like it's weird. Like I, yes and no, I'm not going to say Netflix killed her career or Charlie Cox's career or anything like that, but did it hurt? Like, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, hurt, it hurts to lose a job, it, it, but at the same time, especially one that you're passionate about, but like, I, you can't, you know, it's not Netflix or Marvel's fault that she did, is, hasn't gotten work since. I mean, look, Jessica Henwick has been working. Um, uh, John Bernthal Simone obviously Missick. has, Simone Missick has a whole new series on CBS. Yeah. Like, uh, go and, and, CBS, and Wilson, huh? Wilson Bethel, Wilson, Wilson Bethel's in that show with her too. And, um, you know, Vincent D'Onofrio has done a bunch of stuff uh he's been acting and directing like i don't think that she certainly didn't she wasn't a bad performer it wasn't like she turned in a terrible performance and everyone was like oh no like she was great on the show yeah i don't know if maybe her agent just needs to do better or there just haven't been the roles out there that she's been looking for but you know i i don't i don't doubt debra and wall's ability to to get work again it's the same thing that happened with um mina masood from uh oh yeah aladdin, aladdin. Yeah. he hasn't worked since aladdin and you know i think some actors hit that frustrating stride, you know, hit that, that point where it's, you're having a hard time. Um, it's a little more frustrating with Aladdin because he was the star and the movie made a billion dollars and now he's got right? nothing. Yeah, but, that one is um, more, that one's even more puzzling. You know, the, the ending but, of the Netflix Marvel franchise didn't have anything to do with, you know, Deborah, Deborah Ann Wall's career and where it went from there. Interesting. Now? Yeah, it's just interesting that um, we're in a day and age where we actually do hear from the actors outside of their, you know, performances. So I'm sure this has happened many other times or similar things. I mean, in in the history of performance and, you know, acting and shows and movies, I'm sure this has happened countless times. Uh, we're just in a time where we hear about it. And it's kind of cool to be able to relate to and, you um, understand the struggle and the perspective um, where they're coming from. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate knowing about that. It kind of makes everything a little bit more human, especially now. I mean, we're like, for example, we're all going through this time together um, and it is ruining a lot of COVID in general is, is ruining a lot of careers and um, businesses and things like that. And so um, I, for me personally, to kind of get on a personal level with an actor, someone we kind of put on this pedestal is nice to see. I think she has so much more to give. Um, and, you know, there might be a little slump going on here and, and it, you know, she's acknowledging that, but I think that that's part of her healing process. And we're just, you know, we're hearing about this now and she has so much more. Like it's, I, I definitely see her uh, coming back really strong in a different way. Yeah. All right, well, I'm with Charlie. I mean, it is kind of a split thing. Like virtually every one of those, a lot of those actors from everybody in like, I mean, Luke Cage is now on headlining a CBS show. Some right, yeah. 
is now headlining a CBS show. Um, some of the people that played like uh, Jigsaw's therapist in is had a new show. She was on Supergirl too, and she or no, that was before Punisher, but she had another role after that. Like a lot of I mean, the people, she started Netflix. a movie last year. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. She's and, in Escape Room. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. Um, pretty much. Oh, Deborah Ann Wall. You're talking about? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and that different... wasn't a bad. And that wasn't a bad movie. It was no, actually it was one of the better horror movies I saw last year. So, yeah. I mean, I get it. She did True Blood. I mean, she had this Marvel role for a long time. She had, to be fair, she came out of the gate with like a lot of big franchise yes. support underneath her. So you come out of the gate that fast. I can see how it, it can seem shocking when it slows down into like normal work struggle levels. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and we love her. I mean, I even she even favorite tweet tweet from uh, daredevil season three with that whole karen backstory thing i like was like praising on twitter so she's a great actress just like keep at it keep at it Don't yeah, yeah. we believe Don't in you marvel netflix thank you that's my theory of we life all back. right i mean i don't know about all that i gotta be in quarantine <laughs> right now uh i got stuff to do but uh when we come back we're gonna deep dive into some of the things that are happening in entertainment including netflix's tiger king new uh new episode uh, what happened when SNL launched from home and all that Matt stuff, I promise. So stay tuned. All right. So Charlie, I brought you on today because I thought you'd be a good person to appreciate uh, and just quick do kind of a visit. What'd you think of SNL at home this week? Um, so I did like I did most weeks of SNL. I didn't watch the the live episode. I watched the, I kind of put the skits in a playlist and just kind of watched through them. Um, but I, I think that they did about as great of a job as they possibly could have in the circumstances. Um, was it like the best episode of SNL ever? Not at all. But um, some of the skits were really fresh and fun and they found really interesting ways to use the technology that they had. Um, you know, the the talented people were still seeing, Kate McKinnon is always awesome. Um, and she really got to highlight that in some skits. Although the, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg thing wasn't that funny, but you could tell she's having fun with it. It seemed like a, hey, Kate, you can just do something because you're Kate McKinnon and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, but like she was really, really funny on the Zoom call thing with Eddie Bryant, um, where they were the secretaries trying to figure out how to, yeah, how to use Zoom. That was really great. Um, I don't know if it was in the episode or it got cut and was just on, on YouTube, but the, um, the Kyle Mooney audition sketch, whenever they let Kyle Mooney be weird like he is, it's really, really funny. And he was like, it was some old 1993 audition thing where he was trying to, he was a stand-up comedian auditioning for a um, for some Elmer Fudd movie, and it was just he was really cut? sad, but he was trying to hide it. It was so funny. It got um, cut. It wasn't. I, it didn't. Show. I mean, no, it wasn't in. I saw the Hulu replay. It wasn't in there. Okay. Kyle Mooney's yeah, sketches the get cut too. all the time, and it's really disappointing because Kyle Mooney's very, very funny. <laughs> and he's so awkward. Him. It's so great. Um, I, I don't know. Having having weathered through a lot of his like weird him and Beck Bennett skits of like them just shooting home videos i'm like oh I'm, oh that stuff's back i feel like it's such a different style of comedy than kyle and when they put or put together they sent they, they kind of cancel each other out and doesn't work yeah. but just solo kyle mooney stuff um like uh brigsby bear was a movie from a couple years ago that was so underrated people didn't talk about it. very very funny unique weird great i'm movie. trying to sell brigsby bear um, on this show. Oh, Brigsby great. <laughs> but Stop. kyle mooney's really funny and, and well, they gave him a chance to do that with he's this all right. he's he all right. so uh, was, let's talk about the real <laughs> breakout star this week chloe Feynman had the greatest week this week uh chloe oh, is always pretty good what's that yeah the master class oh yeah. my gosh that was my favorite there you the go whole boom thing. see so, chloe, this was chloe Fine, and she's been bubbling really quick like she's been coming up fast she was great in the bond sketch with uh, daniel so craig good. as like a bond girl but this was like her week to break out and that master class thing where she's carol basket oh and, and uh timothy chalet i loved the stuff. jojo you the probably don't Chalmette know jojo great. yeah dancing with the stars. like she and that was just her at home so she, this was a good week for her to kind of make that play for being a that next Kate McKinnon. And, well, and, and I mean, and <laughs> Heidi Gardner has spent all season establishing herself as like the next, the next big SNL star. Um, I think all season long, we've watched Heidi Gardner. Happen. It's going to be Chloe Feynman. I mean, I think, I think both of them are going to be great. I'm just saying, There's I only think this was one. another, it's only this is another one, like, showcase. This is like, one of them just take screen time. Heidi Gardner. It's a via senor and it makes me mad. Because <laughs> Melissa. Heidi Gardner is very funny. In every skit she actually gets to write and shine in and she doesn't get to do it real often so as charlie's but kyle mooney that's yeah she's 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 adorable. just a comedy it, it, she's adorable she's when, when you have someone who's good at really really awkward comedy i feel like snl doesn't often know what to do with them yeah. and they kind of get put off to a corner 
Um, and you know, that's what was so big about the, the previous, like the two thousands era cast, you know, when people like Kristen Wiig and Bill Hader and Adam Sandberg and, and um, especially uh, Fred Armisen, like they took their weirdness and they, they like, forced it onto stage. And, yeah. you know, I want to see that from, from this cast. I think there are people that are really, that are really great on there. Like, you know, Heidi Gardner and Melissa Villasenor and, and Kyle Mooney. Um, and this, it was a great weekend update too. That the, whenever Colin yeah. and that was my Michael do the, uh, yeah, the weekend update was great. That was my whenever favorite. they make each other read their jokes. Those are great. That, yes. Those bits are always so good. The laughter was a little cringy. Like I felt like they were trying too hard to laugh at the jokes. The people that were on Zoom, like ah ha ha ha, like they were like, they were like eating their mics, but it was good. <laughs> I did love that Tom Hanks addressed that in his monologue. It was great. And yeah. was like the laughter is a little eh, like, which I also thought was great by the way, just like addressing everything that was going on and like yeah. the way only Hanks can, especially as someone <laughs> who went through it. Like it was great. I thought that was it was it was a lot better. I wasn't necessarily looking forward to this episode um but i thought they did a really good job so. yeah uh, the right, one thing right. i think i'd like to see is them do to have a host next week that actually participates in skits because i, I think having a host is part of what makes snl work week in week out um and having someone next week that is actually in i'm surprised they didn't have stefan back and have bill Hader come in and do like stefan mm -hmm. talking about quarantine and things like Listen, that like you're going you're going you're turning I thought they would. Far. We don't turn up. We don't have time for all this turn up about this. Now. I just love that Kobe got so it. angry at Brinksby Bear. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're not going off into Brinksby Bear land. <laughs> like, all right, let's pull it back. So, uh, Janelle, you wanted to do a quick shout out about Westworld. And, um, you know, I'll do a quick one uh, drive by on Westworld. Westworld, I mean, I think it's lost its magic. I think it kind of sucks now. Um, I'm going to watch this, this third season because it is. But them taking it out of the park and the whole kind of themes about reality and stuff and trying to do this dystopian sci-fi thing. And they tried to throw a big action sequence in this one this week to kind of sell it. And it just, it was just kind of like, eh, yeah, not really. With Speed West chase with no driving. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I'm not really, it, I didn't come to Westworld for like action and things like that. So, you know, yeah, it just of, felt like a joke when he got drugged. Um, spoilers. By the way, lots of spoilers. When he got drugged, the, the use of music was so jarring, like random songs that we have never heard in stylings we've never heard on the show. Yeah, well, Smash to put in context, us. Aaron Paul's character gets yeah. drugged with this psychotropic drug that's called genre, which is basically something somebody created for TV so that you could fit multiple different movie genres into one drug effect. And so he basically switches the style of movie he's watching, quote unquote, like every so often. And so each part of the episode that he's experiencing is like a different movie genre. And it, it's pretty track is so jarring. It's just yeah. weird. It takes you out of it completely. I mean, like my fiance was like, can I please turn this off? Just when that hit, he was like, can I please turn this off? This is terrible. But I was like, no, we're pushing through. We're watching this episode. <laughs> Oh, That's there's so one weird, saving... You guys seem so high on it the first couple. I episodes. know. I mean, it was it was sound promising. I mean, it was, but it it's just become basic. There is no twist. There is no intrigue. It's straight up just a conflict between robots and people. Mm -hmm. Um, the one saving grace this season has been Vincent Cassell is in it, so and good. he's so good as this kind of like mastermind villain. And this episode had some interesting things about his backstory and flashbacks. And his character is very compelling. And I would. I would watch a lot more of the season be about him, but uh, unfortunately. Same, and where's so May? <laughs> yeah, and like the whole thing's like, yeah, it's just, it's just basically Dolores being the Terminator. And yeah, I'm sick of Dolores. Kind of, and it's She's... as good as any Terminator movie has been lately, so. <laughs> um, I do want to point yeah. out, just, just based on a fan vote on IMDb, last night's episode is the second highest rated of the season so far. Yeah, yeah, well. Or last, uh, Sunday nights, whatever night it was. Yeah, I can imagine. They saw car chases I, and explosions. They were like, the yeah, second awesome. End, like, uh, the second half of the episode was good. It's just the front was so weird and hard to watch that I just, it kind of messed up the whole episode for me. And that's a good segue for weird to hard to watch is to <laughs> uh, our, one of our main topics is Netflix, Tiger King. So Tiger King is not done yet. Uh, we got a new after show special, which I couldn't figure out when I was trying to do the show notes. I hadn't watched it yet. And like what this even was. So I sat down and watched it and it's called Tiger King and I, and it's an after show kind of recap special with Joel McHale hosting. Uh, 
I don't know why that was just random, but he's, he's there. He's hosting it. Uh, cause Netflix community now on Netflix. Um, that's gotta be why. Cause there's no, other <laughs> yeah, there's no other reason. Right. I mean, he's, he's, <laughs> he's a, he's a big fan of Tyra King. I think that yeah. there was a, that is Netflix he, saw that. Is yeah, he? I mean, Cause he, you yeah. wouldn't know it from his hosting ability. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, Anyway, oh, Matt, Sam, just, I'm just saying like that show everything he hosts, too. he comes off as like he could care less about being there. I know that's kind of his thing, but it is annoying to watch. Have you ever watched Community before? Community is great when he hosts things. I when mean, but that, that, that's, that's his character. He, he got awards. the job he said, doing he said suit, and that was his... Matt, Matt said that's his shtick. That's um, his thing. But it's not good. I mean, he was kind of a weird host for this. But he was unafraid to ask some of the questions that we needed asked. And uh, Tiger King and I is actually pretty good because it did address a lot of the things like, you know, we were wondering about very visit, like audibly vi- wondering about on this podcast, you know, when we were going through all the reviews and spoilers about, you know, how certain people feel and specifically how people take it now that they've kind of seen themselves, which was my favorite part of yeah. kind of, of hearing this. Uh, and just seeing how people, which people reacted well to it, which people said it was like kind of BS and which people said other people were saying it was BS because it was, it was really well done. Um, and just getting some of the factoids out about this. And yeah, after seeing this, I agree with our feature that Nicole Drum wrote up, who she's been getting some flack online about this, but uh, we wrote up a feature called, you know, stop making like Joey exotic, like a lovable cartoon character or something like that. And yeah, after you start hearing the things that people are actually conf- like saying about this guy in the special, like it, it's it's pretty much the truth. We should not be making this guy like some kind of folk hero. Like he's the worst. I mean, he's like the worst in every type of way. He just like drugged teenage boys with meth so he could like sexually exploit them. Ran like a crazy crooked zoo. Screamed about murdering this woman that he clearly wanted to kill for like a very long time. And we find out, and I think this is the most telling thing that like kind of really brought it home to me is the uh, journalist guy, Rick, what's his name? Uh, I forget Rick. So. Yeah, it's Rick. Anyway, so the guy, uh, the journalist guy, Rick, when he was just kind of saying like the real character of Joe Exotic is not like some animal lover that like the two cats he was like posing with, one's like blind and like yeah. one was tranquilized. And it's just like this guy actually hated animals and he like shot a tiger in the head because he, because it got aggressive with him and he was yeah. scared of it and like, just but, yeah i feel bad like, for that one zookeeper who's like haunted by the looks of the dead tigers in his dreams like yeah but like that's like my core issue because i agree with you like completely and and i and i feel like you should actually go read nicole's piece uh like asap because it was actually it was really good and it brings some of that into light and it's it brings some of those things into light that i wish the netflix documentary that had multiple episodes and money behind it had also done because it's like right. they kind of like this was sort of a weird like retcon to me. Like you you rode the hype of the sensationalized caricature that you kind of built up in your show. And then you did an after show with one, the two people who like people really want to hear from, neither one is part of it, obviously because Joe's in prison and also uh, because Baskin like doesn't like how she was portrayed and doesn't want anything to do with it. But then like you get all this, all these other opinions and like closer insight and it's like oh this was really terrible like and it provides you can say it provides necessary context but that's also context that kind of needed to be in your show so it it's weird Especially to me like suicide. yeah like there's stuff i had in no here. idea that he didn't mean to shoot him so i knew that i remember because get that they said that in the thing he was surprised and the way they talked about him they kept saying like he was an idiot and like he didn't mean to right well they play it up as he's this stupid clown yeah. but again it's it's not that simple and this lays out some of those things in in better detail and less production budget than your full thing so like it it i understand why netflix did it because of course you're gonna ride that gravy train and there was additional insight to gather here but it's also kind of like a referendum on the original documentary that maybe that was a little too popcorn and you guys didn't quite do what you should have well, yeah, I mean, I think the most interesting thing for me was hearing people kind of confess. Like, it, I was surprised how much overwhelming consensus there was that, like, no, like, Joe is a POS and Jeff, I'm cool with Jeff, like, and working for Jeff. And I think this looked much better for Jeff because it's I just was like. I surprised yeah. by that, actually. Yeah, everybody's like, no, Jeff's kind of, it's, everything's normal now that he's running this place. And I was like, yeah. Dad. Not what I thought. I thought you'd all be like dead and buried in the swamp by now by the documentary. <laughs> yeah. Like, 
And like, no, he's just like, you know, he's got his wife and his bang maid and like, he's just chilling. There are tigers and like, I do yeah. miss Doc. I wish they had Doc on. Doc is the the worst. I know. I wanted. The worst. I wanted to see what he was doing. After like they're the show. they're all bad and like there are people out there that think that Joe shouldn't be in jail and that's insane. The only thing I'm mad about about Joe being in jail is that they're not all in in prison. Every yeah, single one right? of the big cat owners on the show needs to yeah. be locked away. Like oh, yeah. they're the only good people on that show at all were the ones that like like Saf. Saf is a nothing wrong with Saf at all um the the producer guy uh rick like he was fine well you he know? said i know he admitted he said like that he's so messed up like he's one of the more interesting people because like he is a journalist and he like knew better and he had the oversight and he says at the end he's like i gave up all my journalistic integrity because i think he saw, he told the story about the horse right like joe exotic taking that woman's horse who desperately couldn't hold on to it but loved that animal and said you have all this land and he like really came to her as benevolent like yeah we take care of animals like and like you know like i'll take them off your hands you don't have to worry and as soon as she drove away he shot the horse in the head and cut it up and was like i don't take care of anybody's effing animals you're tiger meat now and he fed the horse to his tigers like like yeah yeah like so rick old... saw that but so that guy knew he that yeah he like, had, like he like, he did wrong but he i don't think he's not telling anybody. i don't think he's like some evil abusive no, he's person, a guy like who's like he's abusing himself. Like he's yeah. haunted by it. Like <laughs> yeah. he's just like I I got sucked. He's a guy who feels like he he had that cult experience. Like he got sucked into a cult, and he knows even with his journalistic kind of overview, he still got sucked in. It's like yeah, I lost myself, and now I have nightmares about it in Norway or whatever. <laughs> like yeah, so I don't know, man. It's a crazy place, Tiger King. But it's crazy to hear that dude's like more famous than ever and is trying to like leech that fame through prison bars right now. Like, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Netflix. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna be honest, as as much as I was into the series when it started, like once I ended it, I was like, all right, I'm good. I have not watched the Same. reunion, the reunion show. I don't I have did a lot today. of I don't have a lot of interest yeah. just to I did. I just had to know what it was. But like, no, I don't want to follow further adventures with these people. Like, I don't want a spin-off no. show. I like, don't unless if you have a documentary about Doc Annell getting invaded and thrown in prison, I will absolutely watch <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, that's the next thing I want to see. I want to see this one inspire more investigations that like then you know, Tiger King, Fall of an Empire. Like, yeah, show me that. Show me when we start closing these places down and a bunch of these people get arrested. But I mean, you've got the Kate McKinnon thing coming. Yeah, the Kate McKinnon thing, the uh, Ryan Murphy thing. Yep, yep. There's a lot yeah. coming. So, oh God, I, yeah, I know. I just it's gonna be like the next Duck. They should have done us before like this the weird... documentary dropped. <laughs> next crazy Duck Dynasty, which half of America is gonna like celebrate, and it's absurd to hear like this is what's being celebrated all over the world too. Like, mm -hmm. dude, in Norway's like down the street because it's a big thing in Norway. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, like they're gonna wow. I saw there was one heart. silver lining, I think, about the timing of it all that. Uh, so uh, I think for Caroline Framke with Variety, um, she wrote a piece similar to, to Nicole's about like, we don't need to humanize this anymore. Like this, this is pretty terrible. And we're not acknowledging that. Um, but she she mentioned in there, like, it's probably a good thing that it came out in March or February, whenever it did, because hopefully there's enough time between now and Halloween that we can avoid oh, every gosh. other couple on Instagram going oh gosh, to Halloween please. as Joe no, Jonathan and Carol Baskin. No, you're You've there obviously be. never Friend been to a like oh, a oh it's frat it's gonna happen. Party. But the, the timing at happen. least I think makes it there'll be less than there would have been if this would have come out in like I August. Mean, there won't be <laughs> Let me just lay out Harley to you Quinn. Alpha Sigma Phi my butts like Tiger King themed Halloween party. You're gonna have dudes going as Joe Exotic with some horrible LGBT slandering things oh there. Gosh. You're gonna have dudes who think their players going as Jeff with two chicks who they find from Delta Sigma, like my Uranus that come in and like dress as those. You're gonna have everybody dressing as the the one armed lady is gonna go. Somebody's gonna dress as a dead baby tiger, like a gentleman. You know, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And somebody's gonna go as Carol Baskin's dead husband. Like it, it's it's hey, gonna go. Fully, all, all, this is we can just weed people out. The only people you'll want to talk to at Halloween's are, are Halloween are the ones dressed like John Finley. You know they're gonna <laughs> be the real what? ones. And you know what? I'm so happy about this because I feel like I can go to this party, and 
it's going to be the first time in years I'm going to go to like Alpha Sigma Uranus's party and like not have to worry about blackface at all. So like I'm super duper happy about that because there is no way it's involved in this thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so on that note, let's talk about Matt, all of Matt's Matt stuff. So how, Matt. How am I supposed to follow that? I don't know, but uh, you're, you're, you're right. closing out the show, buddy. So uh, uh, tell us about all your Matt stuff today. Okay, so uh, <laughs> moving from oh. that to uh, I've been, uh, as any Final Fantasy fan has been doing, I've been playing Final Fantasy VII Remake. Uh, I've been waiting for this game for a long, long time. Uh, you can read our full impressions and everything on the site. Uh, you can also check out a bunch of my starter guides and guides throughout the middle of the campaign uh, to help you out, especially with one materia that is a pain in the rear. And I had to take like nine screenshots to find it. So uh, that is there for you. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to highlight is for, and I know Kofi's like a big Final Fantasy fan of, of this one in particular. And, you know, the original game had like beloved characters. I mean, Tifa, Cloud, of course. Uh, but you also like had these secondary characters like Wedge and Biggs and, and Jesse um, that were, you know, they were present and, and they developed like a cult following because like there are some interesting parts in the original with them, but they weren't fleshed out as full characters. And one of the things the remake does is because it spreads out the story. I mean, we never leave really Midgar in this first game, right? So, I mean, that was... I mean, this was a three disc game back in the day. So like for this whole 40 hour campaign to never leave really the city gives a lot of these characters time to actually grow. And like Jesse from the get go is just a treasure. Like she's amazing. And there's so many people that are like held out hope, the cardiac fans, so to speak of like, oh my God, this character was great. Even though like no one cares about them. Those are like become, it is, it is. It is a game designed for you, Matt. That is what is happening with Jesse. Like people are loving Jesse, Biggs and Wedge, especially like there's whole things on like how people just absolutely love Biggs now. Like how he has all this backstory of like, he was a teacher with, uh, orphan kids like there's all these little things that are dropped in this game that never came up and they never had the time to really grow so the fact that this game is doing that uh is is awesome so any fan even if you've played the original you're going to find so much more content to love also the voice actress for tifa uh is fantastic i was always a tifa person over Aerith in the original uh but i will say Aerith's voice actress is spectacular there's so many little nuances between like her and cloud and their growing relationship so also cloud is, your tifa agenda cloud is kind of a, the whole squad here's the tifa thing i didn't keep the whole squad alive tifa whoa whoa <laughs> whoa tifa Aerith kept the whole squad the, alive woo, my friend tifa is, is cloud is cloud in kingdom hearts is what is cloud in kingdom hearts is that where i know cloud from you are yeah, derailing this whole podcast. hey i'm just checking keep going i'm just checking all right well cloud <laughs> is in kingdom hearts yes uh i Great. will say for cloud was always a curmudgeon in the original and in also in Kingdom Hearts and every other spinoff he's been in, he's even more that here. Like they doubled down <laughs> like hardcore. Like he's kind of like, why would you, you always, there's times in here where you're kind of like, why do you keep wanting to talk to him? Like he's kind of a jerk. Like why do you keep wanting, like Tifa you get because they were friends when they were kids. But like Aerith mm -hmm. is like enamored. Jesse is enamored and you're, and you're keep saying he's, he's so off-putting and like you're doesn't respond. Super. You need to keep it moving. You ain't real. No, deep this into is great. This. You are too far into this already. That's why Final Fantasy VII Remake no is a must move. play. By the way, this Comics. is the content they come to Comic Book Nation for, Kofi. Comics. <laughs> this is it. Also, Comics. Comics. Anyway, you should play. You should check out the site. I like so the video I will games say, myself. For, <laughs> for comics this week, I will. I was actually going with a family-friendly retro uh, deep dive, but I will say Jim Viscardi did drop one that I've actually was a really good pick, so I will definitely throw that out there. For, so for retro picks this week, uh, following Dark Reign, which is one of the coolest times in Marvel Comics, there was a four-issue series that kind of brought that whole uh, conclusion, uh, that whole storyline to a conclusion. That was Siege. If you have the issues, they're also up on Comixology and Marvel Unlimited. It actually does really hold up as a four-issue event, uh, even though they, you know, kill one of them. So Jim blessedly Lee. simple, too. It, it is like it's nice. It's you don't need all the tie-ins. You don't like it's very you can go without reading all the backstory. If you did though, great. And Dark Rain is worth it. But definitely check that out and it's four issues and done. Would love to hear your thoughts on other episodes if you hear that. Uh also for family friendly time, uh I will say Hexvet 
uh, by Boom Studios. It's a really fun book about like witches working in a, in a vet clinic. Uh, it's just fun. The art's like, really uh, lighthearted and everything. So definitely check that out. I will also say Green Lantern Legacy, which is one of uh, the formerly known as DC Inc. books, but DC's uh, young adult line is like a very sweet story about family uh, and a new Green Lantern, but it's it finds a really personal way uh, to, uh, the writer actually lost one of his uh, family members uh, before he wrote this book. And so you can really like, there's a lot of heart in this book. Uh, definitely check this out. And if you're a fan of the Green Lantern uh, franchise, it does a really cool job working all the mythos in with a twist. Uh, I will also say uh, Space Battle Lunchtime. For those who love cooking shows, especially in quarantine right now, like people are watching all kinds of cooking stuff right now. Uh, Space Battle Lunchtime is essentially like an arena uh, space weird mashup, but it takes like, it's a food competition, but in space with like alien races and all kinds of stuff. And it's just a really fun, lighthearted book. So these are all ones that uh, all ages can read. So if you've got the family sitting around, you're looking for something, these are definitely ones to check out. As for new books this week, there aren't that many. Uh, DC does have three releases coming out. We have Batman The Adventures Continue number two, which is the continuation of the animated series. We also have Teen Titans Go to Camp number eight, and then we have Batman Volume 12, and I know Kofi will love this, uh, The City of Bane Part 1. So that one is out in trade uh, digitally. So if you've been, if you heard our previous podcast where we kind of dove into those Tom King uh, stories, this is the thing that really brings it all to a crazy conclusion. Uh, this is Part 1, so you can definitely check it out in one place. So that is comics. Comics. All right. Thank you. That'll do it for this episode of Comic Book Nation. We want to thank you guys for tuning in, as always. We are still putting up episodes every Wednesday, every Friday on comicbook.com where you can subscribe to our RSS feed and get regular updates about the show. If you're just now getting in with us because of isolation and quarantine, which we've had a fair amount of you who just jumped on board. Welcome, welcome to the show. You can also find us on your favorite podcast listening platform. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Google Playlist, and uh, iTunes. I should probably say that. That's the small one we're on. Uh, if you want to hit us up about anything we talked about on the show or just anything you want to talk about with us, you can find us at the hashtag comic book nation, or you can find me at Kofi outlaw. You can find me at Janelle Wheeler and also on Twitch. You can find me at Matt Aguilar CB. I'm at Charlie Ridgely. That'll do it for us. This episode, uh, you guys stay uh, tuned in, stay checked in. And uh, hopefully you're adjusted to uh, life in this new normal and uh, finding new fun stuff like this to do. We'll see you guys later this week. Next episode, I don't really have an outro. I'll still be here. Might not even go anywhere. Might still be in this seat because that's just what we're doing now. So see you next time on uh, Comic Book Nation. We're out of here. Peace. Deuces.